Hey animal enthusiasts and pet hobbyists, it's Joelle here and today we're going to talk about the second largest species of gecko in the world. Let's get into it. Have you ever seen a creature so vibrant, so fierce, and yet so misunderstood? Meet the toke gecko, or gecko gecko one of the most stunning reptiles on the planet. These lizards are of suborder Gekkoda in the family Gekkonidae and are native to the rainforests of Southeast Asia. They are arboreal, living mostly in trees, but also found on cliffs, in caves, and urban environments where they are seen roaming walls and building ceilings at night. Toke geckos get their name for the distinctive sound they make which resembles toke. This loud, repetitive call is used primarily for territorial purposes and to attract mates. Males are especially vocal during breeding seasons and when defending their space. Unlike most lizards, which are generally silent, toke geckos have specialized structures in their larynx which allows them to make sounds. This ranges from clicking, hissing, croaking, and barks. During vocalization, the vocal cords, associated muscles, arytenoid, and cricoid cartilages all work together in harmony to produce sound. This is done by the larynx moving forward into a more upright position. The anterior parts of the arytenoid cartilages spread laterally, which stretches the vocal cords into a transverse orientation perpendicular to the airstream, thus creating tension. The cricoid cartilage acts as a skeletal foundation for the larynx, with movement adjusting the amount of tension. The glottis, which is the opening between the vocal cords, remains open during the caw, allowing air to pass through when expelled from the lungs. The constrictor muscles compress the arytenoids, reducing the size of the laryngeal lumen and bringing the vocal cords into close proximity, causing vibrations. This enables sound production. When it comes to appearance, they are famous for their vivid blue-gray skin dotted with bright orange or red spots. They are also the second largest species of gecko, right behind the lychee gecko, with males growing between 13 to 16 inches in length, and females 8 to 12 inches. But you shouldn't let their beauty fool you. Although they're not venomous or poisonous, their bright coloration may serve as a warning for predators that they will defend themselves with a powerful bite strong enough to draw blood. Wild toke geckos are generally solitary and aggressive towards other geckos and may engage in fights, especially during territorial disputes or during the mating season. The enlarged adductor mandibular muscles involved with bite force is used for defense against predators, disputes with rivals, and subduing their prey. I wanted to test the bite force on myself to see if their jaw strength is true. Let's just say, you should try to keep your distance when performing maintenance. If you're ever thinking about keeping a toke gecko as a pet, they can be a rewarding choice, but I definitely wouldn't recommend them for beginners. Here are some essential care tips you need to know. First off, it's important to know that toke geckos are scansorial, arboreal, and nocturnal, so their enclosure must cater to these lifestyles. The terrarium must be vertical with plenty of climbing space. Ideally, a 24-inch length by 24 width and 48-inch height is suitable for housing a large adult toke. I keep mine in a 16 by 16 by 30 screen enclosure, but bigger is always better, so I will be upgrading this to a 50-gallon tall front opening enclosure. You should include sturdy branches to climb on with hiding spots and live plants to mimic their natural environment. I really like this monstera plant since its large leaves and height provide lots of cover and hiding places. Since they come from tropical rainforests, maintaining a higher humidity is essential. Try to maintain a humidity range between 60 to 80 percent. This can be achieved through a combination of regular hand misting, automated fog and mist sprayers, waterfalls, and drippers. I like to mimic rain by poking holes in a few cups with water and placing them on the top of the enclosure for them to drip. Organic substrates and natural planting can help maintain stable humidity. I like to use a mix of cocoa fiber, reptibark, and sphagnum moss for the substrate. The reason maintaining proper humidity levels is so important is because it aids in skin removal during shedding, supports their respiratory system, and keeps them hydrated. Maintaining good airflow is also essential, and you should not compromise ventilation to achieve ideal humidity. Modern mesh enclosures such as this can be useful, however, temperatures and humidity levels can be hard to maintain. I like to use an external room heater to keep ambient room temperatures constant, 
as well as making sure the substrate is moist, but not too damp. To prevent mold and decay, I added springtails and isopods, as well as leaf litter. I also really like the lightweight mesh panels which allow me to move the enclosure easily. I wouldn't recommend wooden vivaria unless it is sealed with some kind of reptile safe water resistant primer. This is because wood may warp or decay when humidity is kept at high levels. Large glass vivaria also work well with insulating heat and humidity while providing cover with mesh roofing ventilation and front opening doors. The main concerns to watch out for are the development of condensation, mold, or algal growth which can be an indicator of poor airflow. When it comes to lighting, it is usually assumed that crepuscular or nocturnal species do not require UVB. However, it has been found that in the wild, nocturnal species are still exposed to low levels of UV light at dawn and dusk. Because of this, it is preferable to provide low intensity UVB for the 10 to 12 hour photo period with plenty of shaded areas to mimic their natural environment. This can be done with a regular T5 UVB fixture at the top of the enclosure. Another alternative is to provide higher intensity UVB only for a 1 to 2 hour period alongside visible light for the full photo period. I do this by moving the enclosure outside to get full sunlight and creating a temperature gradient for the geckos to bask if they'd like. The basking zone should be between 90 to 105 degrees Fahrenheit with gradual daytime declines in the 80 to 85 degree range. The cooler regions and nighttime temps should be in the 70s, preferably no lower than 75 degrees Fahrenheit. I like to keep ambient room temperature around 76 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit. I find that the lightweight mesh enclosure makes it easy to move outside to get natural sunlight. Being able to observe growth from the live plants also proves this method works with minimal supplemental lighting. This allows me to save at least a little bit on the electricity bill. Nocturnal species such as this are more efficient at endogenous vitamin D formation than diurnal species, so extended exposure to high intensity UVB light is unnecessary and often associated with photodermatitis and increased shedding frequency. When it comes to diet, they are primarily insectivorous. Adults should be offered a few crickets, dubia roaches, superworms, mealworms, waxworms, or calciworms every other day. Some toges can be stubborn and refuse to eat for a few days, but try not to get alarmed if this happens, since some have been observed going a couple months without eating. If this happens, try to ensure your temp and humidity levels are right, and avoid as much stressful interactions as possible. Because they are more active at night, it can be difficult to ensure they're eating, so try to feed around dusk. I also like to use elevated magnetic food bowls with calcium dust to put superworms, waxworms, and large mealworms in overnight. If they're gone in the morning, your toke is likely eating. Insects should be dusted with calcium and vitamin D3 2 to 3 times a week, and vitamin dusted 1 to 2 times a week. You should also try to ensure that insects are gut loaded before feeding. Occasionally, pinky mice can be offered as a treat, as well as hornworms. A shallow water dish should also be provided, but the geckos will rarely make use of it. Instead, they obtain most fluids from food or droplets from vegetation and direct spraying. I like to directly spray the geckos gently over their head. Since they cannot blink or have eyelids, they rely on licking to clean their spectacle. This allows them to drink water off themselves. Aside from that, it's important to respect your gecko space, since they are not the best for handling and better to observe. If you can no longer care for your toke gecko, it's important to find a trusted reptile experience, animal rescue, pet store, or owner that can rehome the gecko. You should absolutely never release your gecko into the wild, as they are already invasive and wreaking havoc in Florida and have been observed in Hawaii, Texas, as well as some islands in the Caribbean. With proper care and respect, toke geckos can thrive in captivity and bring a piece of the wild into your home. They're not just pets. They are a reminder of nature's incredible diversity. Thank you for joining me on this journey into the world of the toke gecko. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more amazing wildlife content. And let me know in the comments, what's your favorite thing about the toke gecko? I'll see you all in the next one. Bye-bye.